Hey, beautiful friends, and welcome to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'd like to share with you a simple exercise to give you animal agility. Now, sometimes joint pain, soft tissue injuries slow us down. We don't move around like we did when we were 17. That's understandable. It's also something that's been recognized in Chinese martial arts circles for a very long time. A lot of Kung Fu techniques, really, they don't matter. A lot of them are fairly modern. But what is ancient, what is effective, are the methods of footwork. Now, these are originally based on the movements of animals, but they're also kind of cross-referenced with Chinese understanding of geometry and sacred geometry and how to move with tensegrity. So you're breathing in a certain way, in a very natural way, and you're really regaining this kind of relaxed mobility that you see in wild animals. Using it, um, stepping on these very controlled angles as you practice a way to make sure that you're not injuring yourself. And then you can go from feeling, you know, maybe some knee pain or ankle pain to being able to confidently chase children or dogs around the yard, whatever you, whatever you need to do. And this is great because having the ability to move quickly and dart out of the way or really fly in your body to have this kind of gliding aspect. It's smooth like ice skating, but on land. It's like almost like swimming or flowing down a river as you're running over rocks. This is the kind of agility that we want because if you get bumped into by something in life, that can hurt you severely. If you can get out of the way, not so much. Same thing with protecting loved ones. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a trope in martial arts, like, oh, the bully's going to punch you in the nose. In my experience, which has been fairly vast uh, with martial arts, from being a bouncer, personal bodyguard, being unfortunately in mass street fights, having been stabbed, the most dangerous aspects of life that I've experienced have been moving objects. And the biggest way that Chinese, med or Chinese martial arts has helped me is being able to get out of the way of a bus or something that might have otherwise injured somebody else. It's allowed me to spin friends out of danger, move them out of the way. It's allowed me to catch children who are just about to come into harm's way. Now, this is what I find the most valuable is regaining our animal instincts is often found within our sense of movement. And tapping into these instincts and footwork patterns is also important for neurogenesis. There are studies on dance and moving your feet in certain ways that show that they can help with neural connections in the brain. And I can't help but think of bees. You know, they go back to their beehive and they do a little dance and they tell the other bees how to get to where there's a source of food or nectar. And I think there's something similar in that with our sense of direction, our sense of place, their sense of proprioception and tensegrity that makes these practices incredibly valuable whether or not you're interested in martial arts. So to begin with, we need to understand that mobility has its roots in stillness. So the better we are at aligning our structural integrity, our tensegrity, the better we'll be able to move. And, you know, I think there are parallels in life to this. The more centered we are, the more connected we are within ourselves, the easier we can move in any direction we please. It's oftentimes when we feel that we're blocked in life. It's not necessarily that we can't get there to where we're looking at or where we're envisioning ourselves to be, but it's oftentimes something that's off internally. So to begin with, we do a heaven to earth posture scan. And we do this through what are called the seven stars, which are the major joints of the body. So scanning from top to bottom, you visualize the head suspended from above and the rest of your body just kind of hanging like it's from a string or a marionette. And this visualization is going to be very familiar. If you've ever gone to a Tai Chi class, you're going to go, yeah, okay, I've heard this before. Maybe Alexander Technique, you know, yeah, that's right. So good if you have that kind of experience, that's wonderful. 
then you're going to go from the head to the shoulders. And just imagine the trapezius is just released like it's been cut, just drops. So you can just feel your shoulders drop and let them just kind of sink. And you feel the freedom of your shoulders kind of sinking and rolling into place, almost like a marble in a wine glass, just finding where its own gravity is pulling it to a central position. This is the second star. And the mobility of your shoulders is also very important. We often just think of them as hanging there, but the way our shoulders move can be very important for catching a glass that's falling or moving through crowds of people. We need to understand where our shoulders are in space because not only is the arm connected to it, you need to think of it as a counterbalance for your hip. So as your shoulders are hanging there, let that weight continue and lengthen through the elbows. And this is the third star. You want the weight of that to stretch through the arms and really feel blood circulation flowing through that all the way down to the fingertips and hands. And the hands are the fourth star. So how they're turned, how they're, uh, how they're moving or curved, you can feel the blood flow, you can feel the gases move more freely within the blood and all the way out there. And that'll cause um, increased blood circulation as the nitric oxide reaches. So once that's nice and relaxed down to your fingertips, imagine your piriformis muscle, which is at the point about gallbladder 30. It's just kind of in um, your gluteus, medius, you're just going to imagine that just releases. Just imagine your buttocks just release and are just relaxed. And that's going to allow your tailbone to drop to a central position. And as it relaxes into place, you may notice that there's tension that begins to get worked out in the sacrum and the sacroiliac joint. Totally natural. Just enjoy that relaxation. So this is the fifth star. Then you want to feel the weight on your knees, pressing through your feet all the way into the ground. As you feel the weight in your knees, just imagine that the point on the front of your shins, stomach 36, is pushing into the ground. And this is the sixth star. Then feel the bottoms of your feet at Yongchen, as though they're growing roots in all directions. Kind of going out in a circle in all directions. And this is the seventh star. So this kind of top-down visualization is common in, in Tai Chi schools. The particular visualization like the cutting and releasing at the shoulder and the um, gallbladder 30 releasing, that was a variation that Clayton Shu shared with me. And I, I really like that visualization compared to other visualizations. Other visualizations people use is like water going down the sides of your body and back and front. And maybe it's just that I did that for years. Uh, I didn't find it, it was as effective as those kind of more visceral muscular visualizations. So after you do that top-down visualization, you visualize that coming down a few times and then bringing the intent back up to the top of your head when you're done. Then you can go the opposite direction. And this is an earth to heaven or bottom up visualization for understanding tensegrity in the body. So you begin with a slight crouch, should already be kind of have your knees bent, and you just start rocking forward and backward on your feet, really big at first, and you keep going back and forth, and then finally less and less and less, until you find the central position at kidney one. Then you can rock side to side, left to right, until again you find that central position in the foot, at the center of the arch. This is something that Sharif Bey, who's a Hungar master, teaches incredibly well. A variation of this is to then, on your feet, begin going clockwise. Circles with your body, feeling the center of the feet, and then clockwise, going around so that you can feel 
all of the variations of movement that you'll later be experiencing with footwork from the bottoms of your feet and really feeling where that central position is because when you're moving and the closer it is to the center of that arch, the better your quality of movement will be and the safer that movement will be. It's when we're moving from the outsides of our feet disproportionately or one toe isn't firing as much as you're pushing off the heel. This is where the entire body gets disjointed. So really focusing on finding that central point is key to moving well. The next step, you go up to the knees. You can kind of, um, you want to make sure that they're not going out over your toes, but just side to side and circles, just feel where they're comfortable. This will be with the relationship between the knee and the shin itself, tibia and fibula. This is not going to be um, its absolute position. For that, you're going to actually move the tailbone more. Fabrice Pichet is a Qigong teacher. He's very, very good at describing how to angle the tailbone so that you feel tension equally on the front of your thighs and at your hamstrings. So you just move from anterior to posterior pelvic tilt, moving the tailbone back and forth as you're breathing slowly and gently until you feel almost like you're sitting in a hanging chair. <clears throat> it's the central point of effortlessness where you can really start to sink into your structure. After you get a feel for that, then pay attention to your shoulders. Only now think of your shoulder blades as being weighted and just pulling down in the back. And that should open you up in a slightly different way. So next we go to the head and you can start to move that around side to side, forward and back and start to tuck in your chin. And as you do that, you may feel some arching in the upper back as you're trying to straighten yourself. When that happens, and it probably will, go ahead and lean forward with your whole body. Just about five degrees and see if that doesn't help you straighten up your spine as a whole. Then go through the body again, top to bottom, releasing at the shoulder blades, lengthening and relaxing the elbows and letting that relaxation spread all the way down to the wrists and fingertips. And as you do that this time, imagine that there's something in your armpits, almost like, almost like an egg or something like that. There's just a little bit of space, a little hollow area. And you can feel that in the joint of your elbow and in the palm of your hand, just like maybe a few cotton balls. There's this space in that area. Then as you relax your piriformis, just releasing gallbladder 30, let your hips sink down a little bit and go through again with the knees, feeling those through to the ground, feeling the shins as very heavy. And then finally, that center point in the arch, just feeling like roots are going out. So you do this going from top to bottom, bottom to top. And as you do this a few times, you're going to feel that your body feels lighter and lighter. And this is what you're going for. If your body feels heavy and you feel clumsy, there's no point in trying to move with agility because now the amount of weight that's going to be hitting a joint that's out of alignment is going to be really problematic. So you want to just focus on that alignment first. And as you get that feeling of weightlessness, allow your body to just crouch down naturally. And as it does, your hips should kind of drop and sink back because you don't want your knees to go over your toes. Then, you're going to start your first footwork, which is based on the way that a white gibbon runs. Now, obviously, I can't show it to you, and it's probably better that I don't, because I am not a gibbon. I am a second-rate gibbon. But if you look on YouTube, you can see picture or video of gibbons running. And they'll bring, basically, they stay in that crouch, but they move their hips. 
So if you're picturing that suspension from above and then you're in a crouch and you just kind of move your hips quickly, this is how they get very fast motion. They don't need to move their legs very far. They don't have large strides because their legs are relatively short, but the way they move their hips from that crouch position allows them to move like lightning just incredibly fast and they can cover long distances with this kind of gait. So if you're practicing this gibbon walking, you're going to use a crouch and stay relatively uh, stable. So if you had a bowl of water on your head, it wouldn't spill off or a book or something like that. So you're not really going to hop in the air. You're going to kind of glide and taking small steps if your left foot is forward, the right foot will pass the left. And then uh, as the hips return back to the way they came, the left foot will go forward. So this is a way of, it's like running without running. And if you do this slowly at first and then increase it, you can find that if you weren't able to move quickly and advance, um, fast due to some kind of an injury, you may be able to now. And the same thing with retreat. If you need to retreat quickly, you can do gibbon stepping and then retreat very, very quickly. I've used this a number of times when something is falling, it's about to smash into a foot or a pile of wood is about to hit me. I can do the gibbon stepping and just get out of the way. Gibbon stepping is very, very useful too. If you grab someone's arm and do gibbon stepping, they're coming with you. You can cover a lot of ground. I've done this before to move people out uh, of traffic. They're about to get hit by a bus or something. I can grab their arm and do gibbon stepping to yank them out of the way. I don't need to push them forward, knock them forward like they do in movies, leaving yourself there. That doesn't make sense. So yeah, it's a very useful technique. As far as breathing with this, as you're standing doing the top down scan, can kind of just be doing natural breathing. That's uh, very normal. When you start to do stepping, especially more complex stepping patterns, generally you're breathing in as you're stepping and you're breathing out as you're settling into your posture. So if I were to just uh, spin in a circle, I would breathe in as I begin my turn. And as I breathe out, that's when I'll be settling. That has to do with the diaphragmic action. When I'm planting my foot, I want everything to sink down. When I'm in motion, I want there to be a lift. That'll give me an additional lightness. If I want to be moving really quickly, I'll visualize the, uh, the heaven imagery, the heaven to earth being suspended from above that relaxation like a marionette. If I want to move very quickly, that's how I'll visualize. And there's something about that visualization, which changes the quality of movement. So if I'm doing that, I'll tend to use very short steps. If I want powerful steps, like uh, I want to charge at somebody and uh, I'm thinking on contact, I'm going to be flipping them over. It's more like a linebacker moving toward them. In that case, I tend to think more of the earth up approach. And I think of a little bit of the tensegrity between that central point in the foot and the angle of the tailbone. And I'll really focus just a little more on that. It's just a quick visualization that will kind of neurologically bring me back to the exercise, which will allow me to generate more power. So the heaven to earth is much better for um, mobility, lightness of movement. If I'm on rocks and I don't want to slip off, I might use that visualization. If I need to power through or use a little more strength, then I'll use more of the earth to heaven. So this is a common practice within Chinese martial arts. There have been exaggerations over time where people will say, oh yeah, you know, that guy can um, jump up onto rooftops or he can jump from mountain to mountain. Um, I'll give you a little bit of cultural context on that. So first of all, in the Qing dynasty and other dynasties where there were lots of poor people, a lot of robbers were in the mountainsides. And the mountain areas, those aren't arable for farming. So people could hunt a little bit, but it's kind of where China's ethnic minority groups and outlaws have hung out since forever. 
if you're a normal person and you live on a mountain, do you have to carry your pots and pans up a long way? It's an incredibly athletic lifestyle. Some of the mountain passes uh, require you to go up very slippery and dangerous areas. It's almost like running up a mountain. These are just steep inclines. The people there, common people there, have amazing calf muscles. Then you look at uh, brickwork in small towns, especially Qing Dynasty brickwork. It is shoddy work. If you have the slightest bit of athleticism, you can run up those walls because there's all kinds of little things pointing out of them. It's not like some of the Ming Dynasty brickwork that you see that's just, you know, incredible and smooth. It's not like that at all. And then to add another layer, a lot of these houses that people were reported to jump up on, I think your average high school track athlete could jump up on these. A lot of them were very, very short. The average height in some of these areas was around five foot. It wasn't that difficult to get your foot on something and jump up onto a roof. And this is where you get these kind of exaggerations in um, wuxia or, you know, this kind of like martial arts cinema, people jumping rooftop to rooftop, jumping on roofs. Yeah, they could do that. In fact, a lot of moderately athletic people could do that to this day. If you're not used to seeing that because you've only been farming your whole life, then, you know, yeah, that goes into the folktale. Now, as to jumping from mountain to mountain, this is what I learned from Taoists who basically live like cavemen around Qingcheng. When do you learn to relax your legs? You can do kind of a controlled fall. If you've ever been hiking or you're running down a pretty steep hill, it's very jarring on the joints. But if you start to sigh, and you just totally relax, you can almost do a controlled fall with your legs. If you can sink your leg down to 90 degrees and put the other leg out when you're practicing Tai Chi, you can already, it's a very useful skill when you're descending a mountain. So some of these skills are maybe not that useful for combat, but if you're running down a mountain or trying to traverse areas, it's really good for mobility. If you want to get from one mountain area to another, and you're a hillbilly, which a lot of Taoists are, you know the area where you can take a controlled fall running down in a certain way, and you're going to make it down a mountain that would otherwise take five or six hours to get down. Maybe you can make it down in a half hour, 45 minutes, because you're basically sliding down and doing this kind of controlled fall. This is qinggong or um, lightness skill. This is the truth of it from people who do that, and I've practiced it as well, but it's it's not like you jump on water and come off uh, of the water, you know, like you see, that's a trick that people did. But they would use these back roads and come down, and then, you know, they're very athletic, and they can come up the other side. So they're able to go down and up more like a bobcat would than taking the gradual route. So they could leave in the morning and then be in a town a few hours later and people say, whoa, you came down from the mountain. And they'd say, yeah, well, it wasn't hard for people to think, oh, did you just jump? How did you come down? Oh, well, I used my lightness skill. Okay. And the imaginations of common people, that meant that they were jumping from mountain to mountain. And if you're a hillbilly, it means you're probably not rich because you don't have a lot of land and it definitely benefits people to pretend that they're magic. So lightness skill in Chinese martial arts has a lot to do with footwork, has a lot to do with tensegrity, and it's more about relaxing. Footwork in general, it's not about adding muscle, it's about releasing the brakes. You don't need to be jumping from mountain to mountain, but simply understanding this and the scan from top to bottom and bottom to top can help you immensely with your own mobility and stability as you move through as you move through life because you're going to find bumps and the bumps and footsteps that you take can either be jarring to your joints or they can be a continuous and joyful massage it's all in how you approach it thank you so much for listening to the botanical biohacking podcast i'm your host dr andrew miles <music>